Well, if you have your Bibles, open to the book of Matthew chapter 18. And I'm going to begin with the theme verse that's been carrying us throughout this series on prayer. I'm preaching a series called Prayer, the Key to Heaven. And uh, I don't know, you, you, you need to go back and listen to last week if you weren't here. Because we, we op- cracked it open and talked about intercessory prayer. And a lot of people have shared how that was a blessing to them, how as the intercessors we take the middle position between heaven and earth on the behalf of others. And I just encourage you to listen to it and maybe it will be a blessing to you and your family and your prayer life. Today I want to talk about the prayer of agreement. And I, I will confess, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on the prayer of agreement. But I'm going to do my best to give it to you today. The prayer of agreement, okay? So let's begin reading Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Then he, being Jesus, spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. That men always ought to pray, men include women, of course, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone... If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Can you shout amen? What a, uh, how many times have we quoted many of those verses in our lives. I want to try to break it down here and and show you something out of this that that I think is interesting. First of all, he begins with talking about how to deal with someone who's sinned against you or offended you or uh, there's something between you and someone else. How do you deal with that? Well, Jesus said, first of all, go and tell him his fault between you and you, you and him alone. Do it in private. Private is always the way to go, but sometimes people will choose the public route first. I'm going to go tell Facebook first, and that's backwards as to what Jesus said to do, okay? So he said, go to the person first, and then if they won't hear you, you can't bring reconciliation, then take a witness or two with you, and then go and try to reconcile with this person And let them see what they've done. And then if that doesn't work, then he says, take it before the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And when you bring it before the church, I really really believe in our modern context, that would mean bring it to the pastoral staff or to elders or to uh, somebody in authority that can help you mediate that problem. And then what's interesting is Jesus said, if they won't hear then, then just treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. So he's very serious about what happens with, he he attacked disunity. He attacked division right there. Then he says in the next verse, but if he will not hear, take with him two or three more, and by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everywhere be established. He refuses then, take him to the church. Then verse 18, we're given this verse that we've quoted in spiritual warfare and in prayer many times, and then he says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I think if we look at that isolated to its context, it really means when a church is acting under the lordship of Jesus and the church is acting to bring reconciliation and administer discipline, heaven approves. That heaven really smiles on it And then prayer comes and guards against a vindictive spirit. Then prayer comes and guards against a vindictive spirit. So I just wanted to show you the context of this verse. And I'm not preaching this because there's problems at Fountain of Life or something. I'm just preaching this because I'm getting to prayer. But the issue is, then he says this. 
whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, meaning what decisions you make on earth in agreement as the church will be honored in the spirit realm. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he said, if you agree, if you come in unity and agree as the church, I will do anything that you ask. That's powerful. That's that passage in context. So when we look at it, we've often used these promises where two or three gathered in my name, there I am. He's saying, I reside in the body of the church. I reside in the body of the ecclesia, the called out ones. I reside, I am among them. When you touch his church, you touch him. Well, now that we've started off on that foot, let me get to prayer here. I think the... I think if there's a theme running through this, this passage, it is the theme of unity. Because what Jesus is getting at is God wants His church in unity. God wants people to live in peace with each other. And if they're not, there is a prescribed method to get to peace with each other. And He says, I smile on that process and I bless this. And I'm going to bless it with my presence and I'll move when you act in this manner. Can you shout amen? amen? So there's, there's, I can't divorce these verses from the passage, from the context of the passage. But I do believe that Jesus' words have a larger application. That I believe we can use this in prayer. Because he said, whatever things you agree upon and you ask in prayer, I'm going to do it. When you agree and ask, I will do it. When you agree and ask, I will do it. Let's read it again. Such a powerful verse. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. If any two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. It's interesting that the word agree here comes from the Greek symphoneo, which, which is where we get the term symphony from. A symphony has to be in agreement with each other. Have you ever heard maybe some high school bands that didn't quite get in agreement with each other? It's like... Da, 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 da. It just doesn't work. A great professional symphony works with each other, the harmonies and the notes and everything. It's all together. And really, technically, it means in Greek, sim, which means one, and, or together, and then phoneo, which means to hear or speaking and hearing, saying it together and agreeing on it. So when we pray the prayer of agreement, we say it and we agree with somebody and we lock in. Because the prayer of agreement causes you to lock in. Sometimes uh, our prayer lives, unfortunately, can, can be like a, a wandering path. Well, Lord, I th how, how do you want me to do God, I'll pray here. No, maybe, maybe this is what you're saying. I want to pray for this, but I don't know that that's totally it. So I got but when you come and agree with somebody, it ends all that. Because you said, will you agree with me over this certain thing? And you agree, and you basically covenant together, and you lock it in. And once you lock it in, it should stay locked in until God answers. Amen? So, three components of the prayer of agreement. First of all, there's unity. It has, you have to be unified. The Bible says in Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. When brothers dwell together in unity, or brethren. And the term here in Hebrew literally means when they sit down together in unity. And then he gives two analogies. It's like precious oil, the aromatic anointing oil, on the head running down the beard, on the head of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Aaron was the high priest. The high priest was anointed with the aromatic anointing oil, and that anointing oil was made up and unified in itself. It was made up of many different ingredients. And then when it was poured on the high priest, 
it, caught, it went down in his beard. And you know how the oil does? It hangs on and clings together, goes down and soaks the clothes and runs all the way down. That's the way God anoints when we walk in unity with each other. The oil represents the anointing. There's an anointing that comes on the people of God when we walk in unity with one another. Then he said, it's like the dew of Hermon. It's like mountain dew, which falls on the mountains of Zion. What happens? Like the dew the every morning that's there. I don't know if you folks ever been to the mountains before. If you haven't, Lord help you. Please go. Get into the woods. And uh, it's beautiful because in the mountains, you know, you have that morning dew, high enough elevations, it gets really gets sweet. And then you wake up and it's, it's like, it's, this is what God, God coats us with His anointing when we walk in unity with each other. And then it says at the end, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So on Mount Hermon, God has commanded the blessing. And I think He's saying when we walk together in unity, there's an anointing and there's a blessing. When we walk together in unity, there's an anointing and there's a blessing. This is what Ephesians 4 is all about. It's about unity in the body. God uses us, though we have diverse gifts, diverse backgrounds, diverse talents and abilities. The anointing comes and sinks us all together and we all use our different gifts for one purpose. Amen. So if, if, if you're married, you better be in unity with your spouse. And I know you're both human beings, and you will disagree from time to time or see things differently. That's cool. But never let it divide you. Because once disunity comes into your home, it's a wide open door for the enemy to come and get a foothold in your marriage. And don't allow that to happen. Walk in unity of the Spirit with each other. It, look, at a, look at a team. Look at a leadership team. If you don't have unity in that team, it, it can break down the productivity of that team. If you don't have unity in a church, it kills revival and stamps out the move of God in a church. You need unity in everything we touch in society. We really need to figure out the unity piece and walk in it. You know, years ago, the first church I ever pastored, I had a... Uh, I had a church board of a, a, like elected deacons that I, that I worked with. And I remember one meeting in particular that we had a meeting over building something in our church. And there were a lot of people who wanted us to build this certain thing in the church. And so I just I, I talked to the board about it and we put it out there. And pretty much everyone was in agreement except one guy. And this guy really argued against it in the meeting and effectively argued against it. But at the end, I hate voting, but at the end, I took a vote. And I said, what do you guys think? Should we do this or not? Let's just take a vote. And we, the vote won, and we went on and built this certain thing in our church. And then later on, we had a congregational meeting. And during that congregational meeting, one of our elderly ladies stood up and said, you know, I have a problem with the thing y'all built. And I was like, okay, here we go. And you know what happened? The guy who disagreed with it in the church board setting stood up and defended our decision to that congregation. And I learned something that day. He was a great man. He is a great man. And though we could disagree behind closed doors, he understood leadership. That when we walk out of these doors, we're all unified and we walk together. Because we made a decision and God honors the decision that was made. That's powerful, folks. Because, you know, some people think, oh, I go to a board meeting and I spoke my mind and they didn't go the way I go. I'm going to go out and tell everybody, wasn't my fault. Hello? Wasn't my fault. I'm going to save my own skin. That's not, you're not being a great leader like that. You, got, you, you say we're going to stand in unity, and when we stand unified, the enemy has no place among us. The enemy has no place among us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Watching your married life too. I don't know why I'm on this. Somebody must need it. But if you disagree behind closed doors, then... Thank you. Let it stay behind closed doors. 
then you come out and you fight, you fight the enemy and you have to take on the world and take on the pressures of life. And if you're not unified, it's gonna, the tension is eventually going to get to where it breaks that down. So walk out unified. If you're raising kids, let me just go on there. Why not? If you're raising kids, never go to your kids. And say, well, listen, you know I'd let you do that. But your mom just ain't going to have no part of it, so... Let's just blame it on her. No, you agree behind closed doors because kids will work every angle they can work. Because if dad don't do it, then they're going to ask mom. Mom don't do it. They'll go to grandma or they'll go to somebody to try to get it done. So you have to agree behind closed doors that you're going to stand in unity together because unity is powerful. Also, never argue in front of your kids, okay? Don't do, if you do that, stop it now. If you, if you argue and yell and raise your voice in front of those kids, stop it now. As your pastor, stop it now. Because you need to get your, you need to grow up and get your stuff together behind closed doors. So, because this, I'm telling you what, we have families that are fractured in America, and this is the problem with our society. Families are fractured, and, and they don't, they're not getting good role models at home. And so be that. Come on, we are the church of the living God. Be all that. Then when you walk to your kids, walk in unity and bless them and love them and pray for them, and they see a mom and dad that are, that are like steel. I mean, my mom and dad were great parents, and they held true to their word. I mean, my mom... If we acted in public some way and she promised we would be punished when we got home, that she didn't just forget that. Somebody say, ouch. Hallelujah. This is carried through with that word. Okay, let's go. Unity, shout unity. Jesus prayed in John 17 that, the, that his followers would be unified. He said, Father, just like you and I are in unity, let them be in unity with you and with each other. So Jesus prayed for the unity of the church. You think about this. In the book of Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel incident, when the people went out and they disobeyed God and they tried to make a, or build a tower to heaven, it was something some pride element wrapped up in that, that they were trying to be like God. It's the oldest sin in the Bible. It's the sin of pride. It's what got Satan. It's what called, what made a, I saw, saw one church sign one day that said pride made a devil out of an angel or made a devil out of an angel. Pride caused his fall. He said, I will be like the Most High, and I will ascend. And then man tries to ascend to God in some prideful way, and the Lord looks down, and the Lord says this. He says, Behold, they're one. They're one people, and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. God knew that the power of unity was so strong that if they determined to do evil, they could accomplish anything they set their minds to. So what did he do? He came down and broke their unity. He came down and confounded their languages so they couldn't communicate and come in unity with each other. That's how powerful unity is. In the New Testament, though, fast forward to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, the Bible says the apostles... And about 120 people were gathered in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And they were all together in one accord. In one, not only one place, but they were in agreement with each other. They were all in one accord. And then a sound from heaven came like a rushing mighty wind. And the Holy Spirit filled each one in the room. And then they all spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So it's like what was lost at Babel was restored in the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. The unity that was fractured at Babel because of sin was restored in a righteous manner in the new covenant in Acts chapter 2. Can somebody shout amen? So the prayer of unity has to be unified. The prayer of agreement has to be unified. You need to be in unity with each other to get into this prayer 
Okay, I'm going somewhere. Hang on. Secondly, the, the prayer needs to be, at times, the prayer is corporate. And I wanted to throw this in because at times, we need to come into corporate agreement and pray. Look at the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, that they came together and repented as a people. And then they made a covenant with God, and then God blessed them. They were together corporately as a whole body. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus, which some scholars say was as large as 20,000 people in house churches. So when he sent Timothy there as a young man, he gave him great instructions of how to handle that many people. And so Paul says, though, he says, Let all bitterness and let all wrath and let all evil speaking be done away from you and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because we grieve the Spirit when we walk in disunity and let words fly and criticize and gossip. It really goes, it causes disunity and it really shuts down the move of the Holy Spirit because He is. Paul says, shut that stuff up and walk in unity with one another, thereby opening the windows of heaven and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and do what He wants to do with the people. God wants to bless. God wants to heal. God wants to send great revival. He's just waiting on us to get properly positioned to where we can flow in what He wants to do. Can somebody shout amen? amen? There's a great story of the Battle of the Bulge in World War II when there were in Belgium, there were Allied soldiers who were trapped. 12,000 men were trapped and surrounded by enemy forces. And so the enemy army sent a note to one of our generals saying, surrender. And the general just wrote back one word, nuts. Involved in this scenario also was General George Patton. And so Patton went out and, and cursed the skies because they had had torrential rains day after day after day and terrible conditions. And when it, his cursing didn't work, he called in his chaplain. And he said, I want you to write a prayer that God shuts up this weather and gives me a 24-hour window to where, can, where we can rescue these men. And so the chaplain gave in to the orders and he, he, he wrote a prayer that God would shut up the heavens and would give them a 24-hour window to where they could rescue these men. The Battle of the Bulge. One of the most bloodiest battles in U.S. history. So what happened? They printed thousands upon thousands of cards with that prayer written on them and gave them to the Third Army. And they prayed, and lo and behold, there was a break in the weather, and they were able to go rescue the men. I know it's a war story, and it's, it's, it's wild, but I thought, what power in unity in prayer, when it's distributed to people and we're unified for one purpose, what can God do? Three different times in the 1860s during the Civil War, which is the greatest uh, horrific conflict we have known as a country because we turned on each other. But I believe God raised up a man named Abraham Lincoln. And God raised up this man, Abraham Lincoln, and, you know, he had failed. I have a list of things in my office somewhere of all the things he had failed at in life. But then finally, when destiny called his name, he became president and led us back through the Civil War and eventually the reunification of the nation. But what he did is three different times in the 1860s, he wrote a declaration of national prayer and included in it fasting. And he, he wrote, he said, I call on all executive officials of the government, all judges, all magistrates in every state, all to humble themselves in fasting and prayer. Dear God, I wish we would see that kind of proclamation today. Hallelujah. And what happened is eventually healing was brought and peace was brought eventually right in the state of Virginia. You know, So I'm telling you, it's a powerful principle when people come together corporately and agree in prayer over a certain subject and get unified. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, when, when Solomon was dedicating the temple to the Lord and the Lord came to him and said, if my people turn away from me and if they go to other gods 
and this is what's going to happen to them. But if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, how many knows this is what we need in America right now? A healing of the land. A healing of the land. That only happens when we repent and come into agreement and unity with each other and start declaring the good things of the Lord. Come on, right now, raise your hand with me. I feel it in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, we declare. We declare freedom in our nation. We speak against the forces that are trying to bring down America Destroy the dollar. Open the gates for COVID again. You have no authority here. We as the church speak against your motives in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Why? Because I believe the enemy would try to try, the enemy would try to take us all out. But I think we have power to stand up and say we don't receive this in the name of Jesus. We declare and we prophesy something different. We prophesy blessings. Hallelujah! Come on, raise your hand again in the name of Jesus, Lord. We just speak blessings over our area right here, Lord, over Pasquotank County and Perquimans County and Camden County and Gates County and Curry Tuck and Dare County and Chowan County. We speak blessing. We speak prosperity. We speak healing right now. Lord, let the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. Can somebody give him a shout? Coming together in unity and praying like that and declaring God honors it. Think about it in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 when they were dedicating the temple of God that, that Solomon had built in verses 13 and 14. The Bible says the musicians raised up the trumpets and the different instruments as one. The singers lifted their voices as one. And then the priests are standing there all in unity. And the Bible says then the glory of the Lord appeared and filled the house so much that the priests couldn't even minister. It was so thick they couldn't even do their priestly duties. Let it happen at Fountain of Life Church, Lord. Let it happen in our day, God. Let your manifest presence come and your glory come and a corporate anointing rise in this house. I don't know if you've been seeing it over the past few weeks, but I'm seeing the levels rise in our church. I'm telling you. We're hearing of great things happening, outreaches going on outside the doors, mission work going on, training going on, multiple ministries rolling, prayer groups meeting. A large group is leaving tomorrow to go to a prayer conference. Yesterday, our people were out ministering to people who were uh, destitute and homeless. And the day before, we were bringing in new members to our church. Hallelujah. Last week, we went out, just weeded the flower beds and beautified Main Street just to say, Elizabeth City, we bless you in the name of Jesus. Mike Henley's ministry and Ike Harrell, they go out to all the, uh, the government offices and the firehouses and the school districts and they bring donuts and they just say I mean come on donuts can open doors anywhere hallelujah and they bring donuts and they say we're just here to pray for you they give them a letter written by me and they say we're here to bless you to bless this school to speak peace and blessing over it hallelujah and I'm telling you what we may not see the effects of that but it is having an effect We're getting ready to have Harvest Fest again. The last Harvest Fest we had in 2019, 6,000 people from this community came to. And there's a mantra we have with Harvest Fest. Everything is free. Everything is free. Number two, it's done on Halloween night. Some people gave me some hassle over that, but let me tell you something. It's Satan's night and all that. Baloney. God owns the universe. We are the church of the living God. What we say, we sit in the driver's seat through intercession. I preached it last week. And what we're doing is we're not participating with the world. We're not participating with witches and goblins and all that garbage. We're coming out to say we have an alternative. And we're going to pray sanctification and blessing on this property. And if you want to come, you've been prayed for. And now you're going to be loved and touched by somebody from the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. And we're going to put our fingerprint on this on this area in Jesus. Jesus name. Oh, 
Oh, hallelujah. First year we did this, we did it out in the front yard right here, and, and we prepared for a couple hundred people, and, but, but we went out there and just blew it wide open with the bouncy houses and the lights and the cotton candy and the, all that stuff. And we had a thousand people show up. Blew us away. We're like, what? A thousand people showed up. Then I get a call on the walkie-talkie. You know, I mean, it's like it's like Dave Regan says, who named that thing? I mean, like they're high-level general people. Hey, look, general, we're walkie and talkieing. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a technical name. But anyway, we were on the walkie-talkies. And I got a call from the fellowship hall saying, Randy Reeder, I don't know if Randy's here, he's the head of our security team, that said, uh, from Alan Meads, and he said, we just led Randy Reeder to the Lord. And he gave his heart to Jesus. And I was like, thank you, that's the cherry on top of this whole night. So I didn't mean to go off on Harvest Fest, but it, hallelujah. When we come together in unity, there's nothing we cannot accomplish for the Lord. Somebody say corporate. We're going to come together for... Breaking barriers. You know what that is? It's a corporate meeting. And something happens. The levels rise. We hear different voices. There are going to be some amazing speakers here this year. Rising, the levels rise. The corporate anointing. We go to another level. We touch heaven. We touch heaven for a few days in a way that we're not doing it individually. We come together and touch heaven. Final thing. Prayers, that, prayers of agreement are powerful. When we agree in prayer, we lock in with somebody, and it's powerful. So what I want you to do is I want you to find some prayer warriors in your life. Maybe you have them already. If you don't, pray the Lord sends you somebody that you can really agree with in prayer, that, that can keep things confidential. Because here's the deal. You don't necessarily want to share all of your prayer requests with everybody. I'm preaching on unity and all that, but let's just face it. Some people just have the spirit of nosy. And they just want to know what you're doing and all about so they can go talk about it or they can post it on Facebook or whatever. No, you need to find some people you can walk in unity with. And I'm telling you, after what I've walked through the past three years, I really look back and, and I tell you something. I think some things we need to keep close in. Some things we need to keep close in. You remember the story of Gideon that the Lord told him, said, put these lamps in these clay pots. Keep it secret. Keep it to yourself. And then once you get up at an appropriate time, Gideon's going to sound the trumpet, and then you're going to break the pots, and lights are going to appear. There's appropriate time for sharing vision and sharing things. But nonetheless, come in agreement with somebody that will agree with you in prayer, and when you do, you lock in covenant with them. And you say, okay, we're going to believe for this certain thing. I'm believing with you, brother. And then if they get discouraged, you can encourage them. Or if you get discouraged, they can encourage you. And two working together in tandem bring it just like supercharges the prayers. I had a friend of mine several years ago who had a son who was in uh, really far gone in, in a sinful lifestyle. And, and they had been praying for him and been loving on him. But uh, he said it came to a point to where he said, I'm going to call a few of my pastor friends and I'm going to say, will you agree with me in prayer? For my son's deliverance. And he said that all the pastors he called said, yes, we will agree. And then finally one of them said, I will agree on one condition. And that is that you have a plan figured out of how you're going to help him once God touches him. And so they figured that plan out. They had a plan. And then those pastors agreed. And then in short order, that boy was out partying one night. And he got convicted. And he called his, his, his dad and he said, I want out. I want set free. I want delivered from this. God set him free. He became a dynamic minister for the Lord. I'm telling you, the prayer of agreement is absolutely powerful. Lock into prayer with people that you know and can agree with and start believing God for great and mighty things in your life. Amen? Hallelujah. Let it supercharge your life. Let it be the high octane in your life. Will you agree with me in prayer? We're going to agree for this thing to happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and but, okay, let me say this. When you're agreeing with somebody, you got to make sure you are in agreement because some people come and don't have the same faith you have. 
say, would you pray for me? I have, there's a certain condition that, that I need. Well, brother, you know your family's always wrestled with that. And I tell you, I've seen 14 people die from that. I'm going to pray God helps you. Okay, I don't need you agreeing with me. I want somebody that's got some powerful faith. Amen? We don't, we, you know. Will you pray for me that my son's saved? Well, you just know how it goes sometimes. You can't change him blue eyes brown. Some people are just rotten from the core, coming out right out of the room, womb rotten. Okay. You go sit under some teaching. I'm going to get somebody else to pray with me who believes that God can do what I'm asking him to do. <laughs> and then stand on the word. Come on, let's get some scripture we're believing God that we're standing on. We're believing for this to happen. Hallelujah. 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 How can two walk together lest they walk in agreement? How can two walk together lest they walk in agreement? Get some people that are powerhouse believers in your life that can hold a secret and will pray with you and agree with you in prayer. And once you find that, you've got a gym. You've got a gym. It should start with your spouse. I'll tell something on me and Dana that uh, we went out to eat for the first time ever and I just took her to a restaurant and uh, we talked a lot about the Lord. I mean, she first of all threw out some difficult questions for me. I was like, all right, girl. Well, I mean, theological questions. And I was like, wow, she's sharp. And we talked about prayer. And uh, before I dropped her off at her place, I, I looked at her and I said, would you pray for me? Because we had talked about it. And I said, would you just pray for me? <laughs> and uh, she prayed for me. And when she prayed for me, I thought, she's not weird. Because <laughs> you ask some people to pray, it gets super weird. It's like... They want to show their spiritual nests off. And it wasn't that. Shadena just prayed. But she prayed with faith and prayed with strong belief. I thought, you're all right, girl. You're all right. You're all right. And she's encouraged me and lifted me up to, to you know, believe greater, Hans. Believe greater, Hans. Let's believe for great things to happen. Let's, let's encourage each other. Come on. I believe we can do, we can come together in prayer as husband and wife and believe for anything. Just believe for anything. Amen? We lift each other up, believing for the best for our lives. Believing for the best. Stop talking all that garbage in your house. Start believing for the best. Start agreeing in prayer. Start standing on the Word. Elevate your life through faith. Elevate it through faith. Take your kids up with you. They're going to feel the effects. Take them up with you. Your neighbors are going to feel the effects. Hallelujah. 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 I was talking to a good friend of mine recently. And I said, man, Dana's really challenged me with her faith. And he said, she's helped us all. She's lifted us all up. That's what a faith person does. She didn't pay me to say these things, I guarantee. But <laughs> Come on, raise your hand with me. Say, I'm going to be that person. I'm going to be that person that lifts somebody else up to believe greater. You can do greater. There's greater things in store. There's mountains to climb and rivers to cross. and There's, there's coffee businesses to run. There's some cloud services to launch. Hallelujah. Amen. There's some degrees to finish. There's some things to repurpose in life. Hallelujah. There's some, there's some people that need to be healed. There's some prayer, prayer room. We're going to lift them up to the next level. Amen? There's some guitar picking that needs to be done. We encourage each other. When I hear Axel play, it encourages me. I was asked the other night, one of the questions Friday night, in a guitar battle, who would win, you or Axel? 
I said, hands down, Axel. But I would give him a run for his money. Hallelujah. <laughs> come on. Come on. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to lift you up. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to push you up. One more. Let me give you this little nugget, and then we're going to pray. You remember the story of Elijah and Elisha? Elijah was called home. Chariots of fire came, separated them. I've been to that very location in Jordan. Separated them and took Elijah home. But Elisha followed so close behind him all the days before that because he had, and the school of the prophets, had an understanding that Elijah was going to be taken away. I don't know how, but you read the text, they understood he was going to be taken away. So Elisha was like, I'm not letting this guy out of my sight. Could you imagine him at the campfire at night? Elijah's sleeping and Elisha's over there like this. <laughs> and then, finally Elijah looks at him and says, What do you want? He said, I want a double portion of that that's on your life. And Elijah said something so profound. He said, when you see me go up, you'll get it. So he didn't let him out of his sight. Then one day, the chariots of fire came and took Elijah up to heaven. And he cries out, my Lord. And the mantle dropped to the ground. And Elisha went over and picked that mantle up, took it straight back to the river Jordan and cried, where is the God of Elijah? And struck the river with it. And just as God had done for his master, God split that river wide open. And you read the stories, Elisha performed twice the miracles that Elijah did as recorded in Scripture. Why am I saying that? Because when you push someone else up to their destiny... You get, the, you get the effects of the anointing rolling down on you. What we've been trained, though, is to criticize those above us, to judge and try to bring them down because we feel if we bring them down, then somehow it's going to make us look better. But actually, it's the opposite in the kingdom. When you push up on your leadership and push up on your friends, you get the anointing, maybe even a double portion Poured out on your life. Come on, somebody shout it with me. I'm going to push up. Come on, I'm going to keep pushing up. So if you're serving in the usher ministry, take Brother Mike, pray for him. Pray for he and Heather. Push them up. Push them up. Hallelujah. If you're in middle school, pray for DeMar and Lestasia. Push them up. I bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, if you're in the outreach ministries with Mike Henley, pray for Mike and Sandra. Push them up. Push them up. Because when you do that, you're getting the blessing on your life. Hey, guys, thanks so much for watching and listening to the podcast. And I hope these sermons have been a great blessing and source of encouragement to your life. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing today, Jesus is the answer. I can tell you, He is the answer for your life. I'd love to pray with you before we leave here. So if you never accepted Christ into your life, or if you just have a need in your life, let's lift it up to the Lord right now. Come on, pray with me. Lord Jesus, wash me from all sin. I accept you into my life. I repent of all sin, and I place you on the throne seat of my heart. Lord, I pray right now you minister to each and every one who just prayed that short prayer with me. Whatever situation they're facing, give them grace right now. Give them the power they need to get through it, Lord. Give miracles, signs, and wonders today, Lord, to those listening in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We declare it done in Jesus' name. Love you guys. Thank you for tuning in and listening and watching us. 